The enzyme catalase is found in most cells, but is particularly rich in the liver where it is located in specialized organelles called peroxisomes. The biological role of catalase in cells is to accelerate the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. Hydrogen peroxide is a toxic byproduct of lipid and amino acid metabolism, so as your cells and as your body begins to break down these molecules, it starts to build up this toxic byproduct, hydrogen peroxide, and then catalase is used to convert this dangerous substance into useful cellular products, water and oxygen. When enzymes catalyze a chemical reaction in this way, they are not themselves changed by that chemical reaction. They can be reused over and over and over again. However, the enzyme can be altered if the environment of the cell or the environment in which it finds itself is altered. Every enzyme is going to operate at an optimal pH and temperature and salt concentration and many other kind of factors uh, work in as well. If the enzyme finds itself in an inappropriate environment, it can become denatured, which means it has lost its shape and proteins require a specific three-dimensional shape in order to perform their function. Enzymes are no exception. They function because they have an active site, which perfectly fits their substrate. If they become denatured, they lose that active site, they lose their function. As we've discussed earlier in class, without enzymes to speed things along, a lot of the chemistry that takes place in your cells could not occur at the speeds required for life. So measuring the activity of enzymes has great importance to human health. Now there are two ways to measure the activity of an enzyme. You can either measure how quickly the substrate is disappearing, or you can measure how quickly the products of the reaction are appearing. In this exercise, you will examine the amount of catalase activity in homogenized beef liver using a crude semi-quantitative assay, i.e. we are going to measure how much oxygen gas is produced by measuring how tall the foam of bubbles crawls up a test tube in centimeters. More foam, more bubbles. More bubbles, more gas, more gas, more product, more product, more activity of catalase. Cutting up the liver into tiny, tiny pieces maximizes the amount of surface area that we have from the tissue in contact with the hydrogen peroxide in solution, and pureeing it into uh, this liver homogenate solution is kind of taking that idea to the furthest possible extreme. It also gives us the additional benefit of being able to deliver a precise volume of liver homogenate to each test tube so that for each reaction we are delivering exactly the same amount of enzyme or as close as we can get it uh, to being exactly the same in all of the five situations we are going to be testing. We're going to be looking at a reaction at room temperature. We're going to be looking at a reaction at a low pH. We're going to be looking at a reaction at a warm temperature. We're going to be looking at a reaction under an ice bath. And we're going to be looking to see what happens to this enzyme after it's been boiled. So I hope you have your lab protocol in front of you. Let's begin the experimental procedure. In the instructions for situation one, it tells us to take a test tube and make a mark one centimeter from the bottom, then make a second mark two centimeters from the bottom. We're gonna do this with a second tube and we're going to label them tubes 1A and 1B. Ultimately, we're going to have 10 test tubes and they'll be labeled tube 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, and so on. So here's my mark one centimeter from the bottom, two centimeters from the bottom, ready to go. And then I repeat the procedure with tube 1B. Into tubes 1A and 1B, we fill them with water up to the one centimeter line. And then we fill the tubes with H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, up to the two centimeter line. Thank you. 
Now we're going to add five drops to each tube of our liver homogenate and watch the reaction. You can already see some bubbles beginning to form. Refer back to the lab protocol uh, to understand what those bubbles represent. Now in order to make sure that the substrate and enzyme are mixing, let's get, uh, agitate the solution a little bit, and you can see that not only do we form a column of bubbles, but that the column forms very, very rapidly as well. So I'm gonna come and I'm gonna try to measure them, uh, but they're still rising. So I have to wait a moment for the motion to level off. You can see that in tube 1A, it went just over the lip of the test tube, which brought us up to about 8.1 centimeters. And in tube 1B, it's just under that lip, we got to about 7.8 centimeters total. Now we have test tubes 2A and 2B, and they're set up in just the same way. There's a mark one centimeter from the bottom and two centimeters from the bottom. Instead of adding water to the one centimeter line, in situation two, we want a low pH. The instructions call for sulfuric acid, but I don't have any on hand, so I'm gonna use hydrochloric acid instead. Still a strong acid. This is why it's very important to label your chemicals, because uh, we have water, hydrogen peroxide, and hydrochloric acid, all of them clear, relatively odorless liquids. I'm going to add hydrochloric acid to the one centimeter mark on each of these two test tubes in situation two. You might notice that I've sped up the footage a little bit while I'm preparing some of these tubes, just to, uh, in order to uh, cut down on the overall length of the video, but whenever I add uh, homogenate to these tubes, I have not altered the speed of the video, so you can see the column of bubbles rising naturally. So to each volume of acid, I am adding the hydrogen peroxide up to the two centimeter line, and now we have a low pH environment in each of these two test tubes. To that, we will add five drops of liver homogenate. Immediately, you can see that there is a difference between how catalase behaves in situation one and how it behaves in situation two. Consider what you know about enzymes, what we've discussed in class, maybe refer back to your textbook, uh, and speculate about why you might be seeing such a startling difference in catalase activity. I left the camera on these two test tubes for a little bit, just to verify that it wasn't a delayed response
picked up that little drop I got there. Happy accident. As you can see, no bubbles are forming whatsoever. So after about a minute, I called it situation two, tubes 2A and 2B, no reaction. In situation three, the setup is relatively the same as in situation one. We are going to add water to the one centimeter mark and hydrogen peroxide up to the two centimeter mark. The key difference is the temperature. Situation one was room temperature, but for situation three, we're going to heat up the hydrogen peroxide solution, we're also going to heat up the liver homogenate. So here I'm getting a sample of the liver homogenate. And I'm going to take all three of these over to my kitchen range. And on a very low setting, I've even put it in a separate container to make sure that they're not too close to the heat source. I got it at 45 degrees centigrade. And I left them there for five minutes to warm them all up. So now we have these warmed up solutions and this warmed up homogenate. How might that affect the activity of catalase? One thing you might notice is that I'm using slightly larger tubes here. The tubes are the same diameter, so the uh, results in, term of, in terms of the height of the column of bubbles will be uh, the same, that they'll be comparable to the other tubes. Uh, I just wanted to prevent uh, the possibility of the, the bubbles overflowing onto my desk. I wanted to make sure that we could record the results, and I didn't have enough of these long tubes to do that for every uh, single experiment. One of the difficulties with the liver homogenate is liver contains connective tissue and sometimes getting five discrete drops can be a little bit challenging because it still wants to connect. So uh, after a little bit of cajoling, I managed to get five drops in each of these tubes of the, uh, of the same volume that I had in the previous two situations. And you can see, once again, we have a rapid rise in the column of bubbles. And in fact, it's so many bubbles that this tiny little ruler that I had is no good. I'm measuring from the two centimeter line that was the top up to the uh, top of the column of bubbles there, not from the bottom of the tube. So at the end, it turned out that in the warm environment, we got 8.5 centimeters for tube 3A and, and 9.5 centimeters for tube 3B. In situation four, we're going the opposite direction. We're going to create a cold environment by putting these tubes on ice. So once again, this is water and hydrogen peroxide in the tubes. We're going to take tubes 4A and 4B and a sample of the liver homogenate. We're going to put it on ice. After five minutes, they have been chilled down adequately. But the trick with this experiment is that we want uh, to keep the tubes on ice while we are doing this experiment. Uh, you get a much better result that way. This is an exothermic reaction, which means that as it proceeds forward, it releases energy to the environment. 
So if you wanna see how catalase operates in cold conditions, you need to keep it on ice because the reaction that it's catalyzing will end up warming up the environment by itself. Uh, in order to be able to show you both tubes reacting uh, simultaneously, what I decided to do was just hold the tube here in front of the camera in the ice bath, and then uh, I decided to just edit the footage together so you can see both tubes reacting in parallel in real time. So we have tube 4A on the left and tube 4B on the right, each with five drops of liver homogenate inside, and both of them being kept on ice. And you can see that there has been a reaction. There is some uh, gas being formed, some bubbles, but a very, very short column of bubbles in each. Uh, and they grew pretty slowly compared to the other situations. The, the other uh, situations where we did see a reaction, it shot up relatively quick, uh, but these took uh, a little bit uh, to get up there, even to that shallow height. I kept them in the uh, ice bath for a while because they were still ever so slightly growing, uh, so I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss it. Situation five is checking what happens when we boil the liver homogenate. So for five minutes I put a sample of liver homogenate uh, on boil to see what would happen to the catalase enzyme uh, in that environment. So. Uh, you'll notice that the sample of homogenate has a very different texture and color uh, when I add it to tubes 5A and 5B. Other than that, tubes 5A and 5B have a similar setup to, to most of the other ones. Water up to the one centimeter mark hydrogen peroxide up to the two centimeter mark. You can see how the homogeneity is a little bit different. And because the difference in texture, um, it, it didn't want to come out as drops. So uh, I just made sure that I put an equal volume in both tubes. Uh, and, and that volume was approximately the same as in the other tubes, uh, but tr it, it kind of clustered up when it was boiled. So it didn't want to um, come out as in the distinct little drops as, as much as I tried. So agitate the mix to make sure that it's in there. So we have the catalase enzyme inside. We have hydrogen peroxide inside. But nothing's happening. After about five minutes, I call it. Tubes 5A and 5B, no reaction. So now you've seen the catalase enzyme and how it performs differently under a number of different environments. Take those observations and answer the questions that are in your lab document. For some of the questions, you might need to do some independent research. So Find, use your textbook, find uh, good sources online, credible sources online, uh, check the school's library website if you need help with credible sources, or email me and ask me uh, about uh, credible sources uh, in order to answer those questions that you have trouble with. But take the observations that you made in this video and then use them to answer the questions in that lab document.